Okay, um, so this is a bit of a longer presentation because what I go through is the software, but I also talk about all the features in the camera and what they're for and kind of give you tips and tricks on how you want to set the camera up, how you want to configure it, what features you may want to use at certain times. Now remember that it's all going to be based on your setup, your scopes, your sky conditions, your objects, but it's the basics are there and to understand what the camera is doing kind of gives you a better understanding of how you can adjust the camera to get the pictures you want. <coughs> now, the nice thing about it is that all of the Malincam software, or all of the Malincam cameras, now I'm not talking about the imagers, I'm talking about the videos, right? So the Junior, Junior Pro, uh, the Extreme, the X2, and the now announced Exterminator, the back end stuff is all the same. So what I teach you about one interface applies to all the cameras as long as the camera has the feature enabled. One of them is going to be the thermoelectric cooler circuit and how that handles the cooling of the chip. You understand that the Junior doesn't have that, right? The Extreme has the cooling circuitry in it. So we'll, we'll, it'll come up and you'll see when I talk about a certain feature that's not available in a certain camera or something like that. I don't have the stuff for the Terminator here, but I will talk about it. I just hadn't had the chance to put it in the, in the, app, the, the PowerPoint after all the Software didn't exist exactly six days ago. <laughs> so that was a fast, fast, fast. Um, so hopefully there'll be no bugs in it. <laughs> All right, so Malincam Control. Now, when you start Malincam Control, whether you're using the extreme version or the junior version, the basic screen always comes up at the beginning. The basic screen, again, what I did was I used an 8 inch Schmidt cast grain, which is this kind of a standard benchmark stick for telescopes. It's a good size, it's a good quality, it's a, it can do a wide variety of things. I used that and I said, okay, what's a good starting point for a deep sky object? Any deep sky object. Now, granted, if you're going to be in a really dark site and you're going to look for really faint objects, it's going to be different. But if you're going to be in your backyard or at a deep sky site and you're going to look at, for example, M13. That's my favorite object. It's always been my favorite object because I can see it from just about anywhere in just about any size scope and you can always get nice detail out of it. It's great to look at. You hit the deep sky button and it loads up the camera and configures it for an average deep sky object for an average scope. That doesn't mean it's perfect for yours, but it means it's going to start you somewhere. It's going to get you a good baseline. Because when you get into the advanced tab, first thing you do is, oh my god, what's all these things? By the time we're finished, you're going to understand the advanced tab no problem, and you're going to see that really there's one or two areas you need to concentrate on, and that's it. The rest is gravy that you don't even probably will ever use. It's nice to have features, nice to use features, but you probably won't play with them. You don't need to. And that's the cool thing. It's only a couple of settings you really need to pay attention to. Same thing with the planet, same thing with the moon, same thing with the sun, and any user-defined, I don't know, you're looking at your neighbor's window, God forbid, that's the button you press, okay? <laughs> it's whatever you decide. And we're going to get into how do you configure the buttons, basically how do you change the settings so that when you press Deep Sky, it's the ones you want. And I'll also show you how to create more. These buttons are just some settings that are quick to load, but you'll be able to actually load hundreds of different settings. Um, Simon's got a perfect example of one where, you know what, he looks at the sky and says, tonight this is an AGC2 sky. So he's got settings called AGC2 and he loads them up and he configures the camera that way. And another night it said, this is an AGC7 night, loads that one up. And you can do that. You can decide what you want. You can call him anything you want. You can call him Fred and Bob and, you know, that's it. Bob's your uncle. Exactly. So, the configuration files that are associated with these buttons are, they're called .mc files actually text files. You can read them with notepad in Windows. They're text files. Okay? They're really long. Some of them are convoluted because it's a bunch of numbers, but they're readable. So there's one called Deep Sky, one called Planetary, one called Moon, one called Solar, one called UserDef.mc. There's one other called Default.mc. And that one is what does the software look like when you start it? I always want my software to start in Deep Sky mode. So what I did is I loaded this Deep Sky settings and then I saved them and 
overwrote the one called default. So when it starts up, it loads default, that's my settings. If all you ever do is solar, load up the solar setting and then save it as default. When the software starts, it's going to load the, load the solar mode. And whatever you decide, right? You pick what you want the software to do when it starts. So using presets, presets are here. You choose a basic preset, you click the associated button, you click OK to write to the camera. So if I have a deep sky preset, then I click the deep sky button. If I have a, a, want a planetary preset, I press the planetary button. You press the right button because don't forget, I'm loading the settings into the software. Now I need to send them to the camera. So you load the presets, press right to send it to the camera. Depending on what you're doing though, this could take up to 30 seconds. Because when you look at the advanced tab, you'll see there's a lot of presets, right? And because I don't know what you've changed from one session to the next or from one preset thing to the next, I have no choice but to send every setting back to the camera so that what you've changed gets reflected. If you decided to change every single option, I have to send them all anyways. So that's why. It gives you a good starting point, but you must adjust advanced settings. Because depending on the scope you have, your sky condition, the objects you're looking at, um, you know, whether you've had a glass of wine or two or not, whether your glasses need replacing, whatever. Okay, you're going to have to adjust. It's not that hard. Pretty easy. Once you fine tune the advanced settings, save and overwrite them. My settings were done for an 8 inch. You've got a 14 inch, and every time you load one of these default setting files, you have to readjust something. Readjust it and save it so now they're yours or your camera and your settings, your scope. That's basically the idea. The next time you use the preset, it will be to your setup. And again, the main functions uh, are across, all versions are the same. Exposure, gain, color. Those are the three main things you need to worry about when you're working with a video camera. Video cameras and imagers are completely different beasts. Okay? Imagers, you're talking about binning, you're talking about stacking, you're talking about a bunch of other stuff. Video cameras work on three principles. Exposure, gain, and color. That's it. Color, pretty simple. Everybody knows what color is, right? I don't like the color of the object. I want to change it. I had the Black Eye Galaxy once, and I wanted to add color. I made it purple. I thought it was so cool. <laughs> People go, that's not the real color. Doesn't matter. I liked it. Also, if you adjust the color of an object, certain features may all of a sudden stand out that you never noticed before. So sometimes playing with the colors, just look and look, oh look, there's a detail here that's not normally coming out. Play with the colors, okay? That's a possibility. Now gain and exposure are two things that are very, very, very tightly tied together. And remember when I said all of the things in the advanced tab, there are only two things you're going to play with? Those are the two things, gain and exposure. That's it. The rest of the stuff, once it's set up, you're not going to play with it a lot, and possibly even never. Okay? Now, the thermoelectric cooler, thermoelectric cooler, it means it's a chip that when you run electricity through it, it gets really cold, and it cools the CCD chip down. That's the interesting thing also, I wanted to just cover up a real quick point. People say, oh, I've got a CCD imager. Okay, well, the Malacan has a CCD chip. Then it's an imager. No. A CCD imager has a CCD chip. It could also has it have a CMOS chip, which is a different type of chip. CCD does not make it an imager. CCD is the chip, how that chip works. Okay, That's all it is. So if people talk about CCD, they always think it's imager, 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 because a lot of them are like that. But CCD is actually the type of chip it is. It's not imager related. Because imagers can have CMOS chips, they can have other things. Um, so the thermoelectric cooler is only on the Extreme and the X2 and the Exterminator. It's not on the Junior and the Junior Pro. Okay, you don't have cooling on that. Then we have backlight compensation and automatic pixel controllers for fine tuning of images. And we're going to get into this. How do you use this? Coronagraph is for solar. If you've never done solar before, you know what a coronagraph is, is when you're looking at the sun, it's a great big bright ball. And I want to see the prominences, but I don't have the fancy filters. I've got some basic filters. Now, caveat to this, you must have certain types of filters to see prominences, okay? But, if 
you've got that big white ball of light coming at you, and you're trying to see that delicate feature on the outside edge, what the chronograph does is it takes the brightest thing in the screen and darkens it to black. That's all the chronograph does. It's not magic. It just says, what's the brightest object? Turn it black. The brightest object when you're looking at the sun is the center of the sun. It turns it black, which you end up having is a black disc. Now you can start to see the delicate things that are around the edge. Because remember that the camera itself is always going to try to manage your picture, to give you the best response. Take a, uh, when you take a picture of somebody standing in a doorway on a sunny day and you're inside the house, when you take their picture, it looks at everything in the picture. It looks at the sun in the back and it says, that's really bright, so I'm going to readjust it. The next thing you know, that person's face is black. Because the camera's trying to do this. The video camera's trying to do the same thing. It's trying to balance the picture out. So with the coronagraph, it helps you change that so that that brightness that's causing the camera to go, wait, 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 wait. It's getting it away and all of a sudden the camera can really open its eyes and now you can start to see the delicate features around the edge. Coronagraph. Zoom in, zoom out, kind of self-explanatory. Perfect for focusing. I want to get my focus crisp. Find a bright star or a cluster. Turn the zoom all the way in, full. Now your stars are really big and all fuzzy. Focus it until they're as crisp as you can get them, and then zoom out. This is what television studios do, by the way. This is a standard video recording practice. Television studios and professional uh, um, video camera operators, they're taught to do this. They're taught, be, while they're off the main feed of the camera, right, or on the preview, they're taught to zoom into the subject's face, focus crisp, and then zoom out. Because when you zoom in and zoom out, the way that these cameras work, the focus stays. So as it's really, really tight, you get to really see the detail and get that crisp focus and then zoom back out. That's what the zoom does. We're going to talk more about these things too. This is just kind of an overview. So the software is laid out like this. There are sections all over the place, and they're pretty broken. They're broken down into some pretty good sections. Remember we talked about exposure. See, I've captured this piece up here because sense up is part of the exposure. And gain. So if I got rid of everything else, I'd have exposure and gain. Uh, but see, it's black here, so this is part of exposure. Exposure time. So I have my exposure time, and I have my gain. If that's all you had to worry about, then wouldn't it make it easier, kind of less daunting when you're looking at software? So. Remember I said color? Let's do adjust the color. What's your color set? Why do you want to play with it? Do you play with your color on your TV set all the time? Nah, you've adjusted it once and you never used it again. So forget about this. We know what zoom is. These are just little kind of, you know, games and toys that we've added. Crosshair, cross box, we'll get into that. The noise detection we'll talk about later, but again, the noise detection circuit, once it's set up and configured, it just goes, right? You don't have to worry about it. And then you've got the automatic fixing control and some other kind of goodies up here. But again, main features, gain, exposure. That's what you really need to worry about. That's pretty well the, the main components. So that's the layout of the software. The second tab is video. And this is where you control capturing your images, capturing pictures, or capturing video of planets or the sun that you want to run through stacking software later and stuff like that. And we have video control, so you know brightness, contrast, uh, gain, gamma, hue, saturation, etc., etc., etc. We have all these different controls for the video. Um, do you want to get some chairs? Yeah, we will. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, we'll get so we have controls for the video. The important thing to note, though, is that when I'm doing video control from within the software. The device that you choose, your video capture device, whether it's the Malincamp one or brand XYZ, each video capture device has a different set of controls that you can control and not every capture device has every feature available. Some of them don't have saturation, some of them don't have sharpness, some of them don't have white balance. They pretty well all have brightness, contrast, and hue, but the software will read your video capture device, it will ask your video capture device, what features do you support? And the features it does not support will be grayed out. And you will not be able to play them. So if you're wondering, how come I can't change this bar? Because your capture device doesn't support that feature. 
different capture device supports another feature. Okay? And of course, Rock's capture device supports all of them. You make sure of that when you, you got it designed, right? You want to be able to control everything, so it all supports it. Um, if you've mucked this up so bad, you press the default button and it basically resets the capture device settings to the default settings from your manufacturer. That's all. And I do this quite often, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to tweak out that detail in some faint object. And okay, I'm done, and I want to slew to a new object, and I slew to the new object, and I'm looking at the screen and I'm like, I can't see anything, or it's all blown out. Oh yeah, I fiddled with this so much. I just hit the default, it resets everything. Now I'm back to a default setting, and I can do my settings again. Well, that's pretty well up here. Um, you select a capture device and you select the source. What's the difference? The capture device is the actual physical device. When you have video capture devices that have multiple inputs like composite video, S-video, and if you get some really expensive ones, they have video 1, video 2, video 3. When you hit source, it's going to list the input options of the selected capture device. But that means you do this one first, select the device, then you click the button because if you click the button first, it's going to say, well, you didn't select anything, so I don't know what it's capable of doing. So you select your device, select your source. Now that you've got your source selected, you hit the preview button, you get a window that opens up, and view your images, right? The nice thing about this is if you want to use <coughs> video capturing or photo capturing outside of the software, you can use something like AMCAP. Run AMCAP. And once AMCAP is running and you can see your pictures, go into the software, choose the video device that you've selected in AMCAP, but don't enable the preview. And these will function. So you don't have to go in AMCAP and go to that sub-sub menu and then have that window that's always in front of everything that you can't close. And so it's kind of a trick to do stuff. Now, for those of you who want to broadcast on NSN, we have an NSN mode button. The NSN mode button just basically says uh, you can't check, click the preview button. Because the minute you click preview, the software says, I own the device. I'm taking hold of that window and nobody can touch it. Video devices do not like to be shared. I know some of you are going to say you got, you know, uh, uh, multicam and webcam Macs and stuff like that. And you can share it. These software are made to trick the computer into sharing your devices. But by native, native mode, video devices do not like to be shared. So, I'm not going to get into the, the mechanics of how do you broadcast on an SN. This is not what this is about. That's a completely different lesson. And that involves so much more garbage you have to deal with. It's, it's not something I'm interested in. Oh, geez. Here, when it does that. There we go. Okay. Um, I put in a bunch of filters, so you know, Gaussian low pass, de interlay, static noise reduction, smooth sharpen, and X sharpen, and then a histogram. Now, I'm going to go kind of go through them a little bit, but different filters will do different things to your image. But these are very subtle filters. The only filters that are not subtle are these two, and that's why they're on the right hand side. Okay? This sharpen, you're going to start to see graininess, and this X sharpen, you're really going to start to see graininess. But if you're trying to or, or tweet out a little bit of a, a, a detail that you can't catch, you can click this on and off and on and off and you just might see some details in there. Okay, That's what it's all about. Um, smooth and static noise reduction are, are pretty good. Uh, the Gaussian and low pass is good as well. Now this is the interlace one, video interlace. 99% of video on a video capture device is non-interlace. Because that's what video capture devices do, they don't interlace. Okay? So, when you connect your device and your source and you hit the preview button, this filter here, this is going to change to true or false, a little question mark here. What it says is that it reads the video signal and it says, is the video interlace? Yes or no? If it says false, clicking and de-clicking is not going to do anything, it's already the interlace, right? But if it says it's interlaced, if it says true, then you can check it off. Because there are some <coughs> video capture devices that do not deinterlace the video. More obscure, more rare today, but it can happen. So 90% of the time, you're not going to uh, deinterlace. Does everybody know what deinterlace means? I'll go through it quickly then. When a video signal is created, and you're looking at a picture, 
this goes through for your television set. It's not a picture that just appears. What you're doing is you're painting on the screen the lines. And you're not painting every line. You're painting every second line. And then the computer goes back and it now paints the opposite lines. But it does it so fast that your eye can't tell. That is interlaced video. Even and odd lines are interlaced between. Why did they do that? Because when video was invented back in the 40s, 50s, you know, they didn't have the bandwidth to send all these lines of data through a cable. They only had half the bandwidth. So they could only send half that amount of data through. How do we get the picture? We don't have enough. Well, it's okay. Send line 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. And then send line 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. But do it so quick and put them in there that you can't tell the difference. Interlaced video. That's interlaced video. And it's stuck around since today, until today. I mean, it's just the way that works, right? That's also why on some older TVs, it looks like your screen is flickering sometimes. I'm not talking about uh, LCDs. This is cathode ray tube TVs, all right? Because it's interlaced video. LCD is a different technology and stuff like that. Uh, so that's what the interlaced stuff does. Uh, histogram, um, we're going to cover it in another page. And then we have the video capture and the photo capture. I'm not going to talk about how do you configure it, because we talked about that yesterday in the other presentation. Uh, and again, we're going to have these presentations available on the web. Uh, YouTube videos and stuff, and the PowerPoints themselves available. So if you missed yesterday's presentation on configuring it, it will be available. But you have a start stop, so do I start my video capture or stop it? Do I hit a snapshot for pictures? I have a size here, and we talked about that yesterday. Um, we're going to talk about the ARM section uh, and the formats of it when we get into those sections, because I can talk about the different sections. So, video controls allow adjustment. And this is all we just talked about it. Some slides may not be available. Default button resets what you're doing. Uh, device button is used for video capture, source is used for, for composite as video, previews, NSN mode. Um, this is basically what we just talked about, right? everything we just said. Histogram. All right, so we have filters and histograms. So filters themselves, we covered off the filters. This is the paragraph about what we just covered about the interlace, the interlace. And a histogram. What is a histogram? How is a picture made when a computer shows you a picture? A picture is composed of pixels. Pixels are dots, all right? And you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of dots in a picture. And each dot can be a different color. But in most pictures, there are only three colors. Red, green, blue, RGB. But they can be a different shade of one of those three colors. What the histogram does is it looks at your picture that you're seeing on your screen of you know, your star, your cluster, the sun, whatever. It counts every pixel and says, how many black ones? How many black ones at darkness one? How many black ones at darkness two? How many black ones at darkness three? How many, sorry, not how many black ones, we're color here. Uh, how many red ones? How many green ones? How many blue ones? at the different intensity levels. And the intensity levels are from 0 to 255. That's why it goes from 0 to 255, okay? The different colors are here. How many are there? It's to analyze pictures. What do you need a histogram for when you're doing this? Somebody's got to have the answer. Come on. I know some of you know this. You're testing this. <laughs> Focus. Focus. What do you mean focus? Take a bright, bright, bright star and put it in really crisp focus. Take the same bright star and put it out of focus. Now think about this from the computer's point of view. What color are those pixels? When that star is in crisp focus, they're almost all pure white. What color are they when they're out of focus? Gray, black, all over the place, maybe some weird colors. So perfect focus, you're going to have 255, which is white. You're going to have lots of pixels here. Out of focus, you're going to have pixels all over the place. 
So it's a bit of a focusing aid. That's what histograms are mainly for. Okay? You could also look at an object and say, I want to analyze the color in the object. But color is susceptible to how you set up your video capture device. Remember that? Now, the rest of this is also susceptible based on brightness and contrast and stuff like that as well. But all things being equal and the default setting, looking at a bright star and just a bright star and you don't care about color, you want lots of white pixels and not very many of everything else. So the less you have here and the more you've got in this line right here, the better it is. If you've got a lot of stuff out here, something's not right, right? Something's not right. It should be white, mostly white. That's what histogram is. There's a bunch of these things here that you can do all kinds of cool stuff too with. Um, I'm not sure if it's on the next slide or if we talk about it later. Let's take a quick peek. We talk about it later. Okay. Uh, but basically, there, the stuff here, there's some of these buttons here do certain things with your histograms. You know, print them, save them, uh, you can pause histograms, because the histogram is actually being run on live video. Normally, histograms are being run on static photos. So it analyzes the picture and shows it to you. This one is constantly running as your video screen is coming in. So do a cool trick. During the daytime, put a webcam on your computer. Start the software up, go on device, choose the webcam, turn on the preview. Turn on the histogram. Put your face in there. Put a spotlight in there. Put a black piece of paper in front of the webcam. You'll see the histogram changing all over the place. And you're going to start to see, oh, look at this. When I've got a white flashlight writing in, it's really bright. All oh, the pixels over here. i got a nice big line here. And then I put a black piece of paper, and all of a sudden, there's no more lines here. They're almost all over here. Or you've got a, a solid line up here because black is zero. So it's kind of a nice way, without having to start with the, the, the telescope, on what does a histogram do? Use a webcam, doesn't work. Look at your face, you know, look at whatever. Uh, we talked about this whole section here. This we talked about yesterday, so again, in the previous presentation, you can get a, you can get a copy of it and uh, what all this stuff is all for. This puts text on the screen. Most people are familiar with that. You can put a piece of text on your screen. You basically <coughs> turn the text on or off. You Type what you want, and you choose one of the four locations that the CPU allows you to make. You know, um, and you click set. The nice thing is you can leave the text in here, set it, and you can just turn it on and off when you want. If it's always the same text, you, know, you want to put your observatory name in there or something, whatever. The reset in the park. Reset resets the camera back to factory default. In this case, it's not the telecam factory. This is the CPU manufacturer factory. This may not put your camera in a nice, happy mode when you reboot it. It's okay. You just go back to the software and you send all the settings back to the camera. Okay? But if your camera's behaving really strange and something's not right, two ways of fixing it. One, you pull the power. Or two, if the CPU has gotten you know, its, its pants in a knot, and even if rebooting is not doing it right, doing this just may clear out whatever problem you have. Okay. Now, the park. The park camera, what it does is it turns integration off. It resets the thermoelectric cooler to make sure that you don't have it in some weird mode so the next time you power it up, it's doing something that you're not expecting. And it triggers a safety timer to wait for three minutes for the camera to settle down. Then you can turn the power off. If you know what your camera is configured as and you're comfortable with just pulling the plug off the back, the next time you plug it in, you know what it's going to come up at. You don't have to use the park, but some people would set it in some weird mode, and then they would plug it back in, and you'd say, oh, geez, the camera's acting weird. Why? Well, because the last time you used it, you left the integration on, because it doesn't turn off by itself. It's actually a setting inside the menu that flips back and forth. You left the integration on, and your thermoelectric cooler is running full blast, and blah, 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 blah. Okay, fine. Press the park button, wait for the timer to finish counting. We're going to talk about the, uh, the safety timer also. That's why there's a starter. So we, can, we can cover it off. The safety timer is important. Let's understand what it's for. All right, so exposure control. The two boxes for exposure. The exposure and the exposure time control for the shutter. Uh, you have the sense up to off, which is up here. Stefan, can you explain the origin of the, the, the words sense up? Not really. Where is this? Uh, it, uh, 
now I understand it and I don't pay any attention. But when I first saw it, I thought, what the hell does this mean? Mm. Uh, and it must have some weird origin. It does have an origin, and I, I've, mm -hmm. I've heard it more than once, and I, every time I hear it, I go, oh yes, that's right. So okay. That's where it comes from, right. and I just, I, I can't explain okay. it right now. But if yes, it, it has some weird origin. If it ever crosses your mind, send an email to the I will. I, and it does, there is things that you can find about it. Now, you have to understand that some of these controls, or most of these controls, the reason they're there is they come from the security camera days. Because the CPU that's in there is the best type of CPU to control these video cameras and control all the settings that you need for astronomy. And they just happen to be security video camera CPUs. And that's why a lot of these words come out of there, these features come out of these cameras, right? Uh, it's pretty simple. With sense up, there's two options you should be looking at, 128 and 0. And everything in between, don't worry too much about it. Once you understand farther and you get really comfortable and you want to look up what sense up really is about, there are meanings and the numbers mean something, but for clarity, off in 128 is all you need to know. That will always get you going. The shutter though, which is over here, is important because the shutter, although you don't use this on deep sky objects, you use this on planets <coughs> and the moon and the sun. Okay, The shutter, it's like a camera shutter. The brighter the object, the faster the shutter has to be so that you, less, you let less light in. What happens when you're in the sun and you want to see something? What does everybody do without sunglasses? Squint. squint. Why are you squinting? You're closing your shutter down. Too much light, too much information. Everything's washed out. Blah, blah. Same thing in the snowstorm, right? It's white, white, white. It's white out. Too much white. Close your shutters down. Oh, I start to see detail. Think about it when you're looking at a planet. A planet is a very bright object. How come when I've got my, cam my camera pointed at Jupiter, all I see is a white ball? Because your shutter's not fast enough. Increase your shutter speed. It's going to close down. It's going to squint the camera, which reduces the amount of light coming in and lets some of the color and features come in. That's what the shutter does. So again, your sense up is set to 128. When you do that to 128, 128, this is what you use to control your exposure. All right. How many seconds do you want the camera's eye to open and gather the photons? Plain and simple. That's what it is. If you don't have it on 128, this is not going to work. And it's the internal circuitry that's designed that way. It's, you can't change the integration unless you're at 128. That's why I said all you need to know is 128 and off. But you can't change the shutter unless it's to off. Right? You've got to pick one. Do I want it to stay open for a long period of time because I'm looking at some deep sky objects? Or do I have something bright to look at? A bright planet, the moon, the sun. Well then, I don't want longs, I want short. So what's short? That goes to off and now you start playing with this shutter speed. Okay, one or the other, one or the other. It's all based on how bright the object is. Now, the safety timer is triggered. There's a star, I thought about the safety timer. But the safety timer is triggered when you change the sense up to 128, not from 128. Steph, it's not just 128, it's 128 mm -hmm. times something. Yes. What is that thing that it's 128 times? That's the thing I don't quite remember okay. the number, but it adds up to about 2.6 okay. seconds. Okay. 160. 160th. That's what it is. Right. So it's 128 oh. times 160th of a second. Yeah. And that's because the default shutters is 160th. That's okay. where it comes from. Yeah. So now you know the other numbers. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. See? Like I said, I knew it, but I just don't know it. All right. Um, so that's what we're talking about here. This is simple. ALC. You use ALC. Don't use ELC. What's ELC for? Remember, we're talking about these were security camera CPUs. The electronic control was that you could hook up a wire from the CPU, go outside, and control the actual security lens for the shutter on the lens instead of inside the camera. That's what it was for. Mm -hmm. okay? We don't use this. When I put it in there, because every once in a while, Rock comes up with this little idea. He calls me up and says, I've got this little idea. What if we wired this up to this and made it do that? Yeah, we could do that. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So you just leave this to ALC. So what's really important here? 128 off. This is where you change the shutter for planets, moon, sun. Then this is north. Oh, okay, this looks bad. And then this is well, how many seconds? We've got this, and we have a custom side. Some of you may know where this comes from. What's the 714 2856? One of the first cameras well, that can Rock, have, not I, one of the first ones, but one of the earlier cameras that Rock made. First was, was two, and then yeah. it was 2612. Yeah. So mm -hmm. one of the, the nice cameras that he made had two switches on it. Mm -hmm. One switch said 7 seconds or 28 seconds or off. Yeah, Remember? Two. Off, 7, 28. The other switch said X2. Well, 7 times 2 is 14, and 7 times 28 is 56. Understand. And you had those four settings. And to this day, those four numbers are still really good numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm almost always here. Unless there's something I'm really trying to get, and it's just in between, then I'll go to custom. But 90% of the time, I'm going to just use the defaults, and it's pretty good. It's pretty good. That's where that came from. Like your presets, the little just needs to those preset to what you put in. So, for instance, if I go to Deep Sky Object, will it, of course, not go to 128 or go to a lower number? No, if you want to do Deep Sky Object, mm -hmm. you can say the sense up is 128 because that's what you want for Deep Sky Object. Oh, okay, yeah, right. What you can't do is say, I want it at 128 and 14 seconds because you can't start the integration mm -hmm. when you boot up the camera. So this is the only thing you can't save in the presets, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's always going to come in like this to off because this is, well, how many seconds do you want me to open the shutter now? Mm -hmm. But yes, this here, right. you could say deep skies, I want it at 128. Planets, I want this to off. And I want the shutter to 1 6,000. No, no, but what I'm saying to you when you start the program, you have your choices, your initial choices. Yes. And you, can, you said these, this is a starting point. Yes. OK. There's, those starting by clicking one of those starting points set part of this up? Yes, this. this. Yes. Only that. That's only that. Only that. Only this that. is the only thing that you cannot set from those starting points. Well, there's a couple of other things. No. You can't set the zoom because right. you shouldn't be starting in zoom mode anyways. Trust me. We had somebody who did the manual configuration and not use the software and turned the zoom on and forgot it was on and shoved it in. And I'm not getting my objects, and the MFR5 is not working, and what's going on? And finally, it's like, okay, let's go through all the menu settings. Oh, geez, you had it zoomed in all the way. Horrible, horrible. He's all those laughing because he knows exactly where he was there when it happened, but he knows who I'm talking about. Sense up, sense up the camera function allowing the user to select the slower shutter speed before it's light. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes at one twelve thousand. You, you, you need to go a slower speed. A 2.1 is too fast, yeah. so uh, or too slow. I mean, so you can go in between 1 1,000 yeah. or 1 12,000 to 2.1. Yeah. That's what the sense one so that's it. is for. Okay. So, so it's, in, it's, the, it's the dividing and the uh, the yeah. changing of the in between uh, the shutter numbers. Came in handy a few times. Okay. Mm -hmm. So whenever you first start the software on the camera, or what's your sense of that? Me? It, it, no, just when you first turn it on, when you first turn your software on or your camera on, it's sort of like, it says it's a 120. Okay, when I, it, okay, you have to understand something. When you install the software and you run it, it doesn't talk to the camera. Mm -hmm. So when you run the software, hit read from. Yeah. It'll talk to the camera and say, okay, now you tell me what you're configured at. Mm -hmm. And then it'll reflect it. The software will always start, if you do a fresh install, yep. the software will start in the sense up at 128. That's because that's what's in the default.mc file. But if you set your sense up control to off and save it, save that in the default.mc file, when you start the software up, it'll always be off. Remember, we're talking the software, not the camera. Mm -hmm. Software starts like this. If you want to see right away when you start the software, if you want to see what the camera is set up for, immediately hit the read to button. Or sorry, read from button. Then it'll read the camera in and then you'll see what your camera's configured as. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's a mistake too people. They start software up and they go, oh, my camera's like that. No, oh, the software is just sitting there. You have to sync those two now. Mm -hmm. So 714-2856, 
Now, under manual integration, you can set the amount of seconds and the quantity. What do you need the quantity for? Well, for now, we're just going to say, if you put the quantity to 999, that's it. A special number that says, I want to look at something 10 second integration. And it'll just open the shutter for 10 seconds, give you a picture. Open the shutter for 10 seconds, update the picture. Open the shutter for 10 seconds, update the picture. Hear what I just said? Open the shutter for 10 seconds, give you the picture. Open the shutter for 10 seconds, update the picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what it's doing. It's feeding you that picture constantly. Updates every 10 seconds. Does the picture that it's updating, um, I know you, you had said something about uh, creating a file to store it in. Yep. Will, it, uh, will it save those updated, each pic every 10 seconds? If we set it up in the software, and I'll show you where. Okay. Remember the arm thing we talked about? That's mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. By default, it doesn't save. It just shows it to you. And this doesn't mean I'm stacking. All right? No. It doesn't mean that I've got I'm stacking I'm images here. We don't stack. A lot of people like stacking. My view on this is this is a camera control software, period. You want to stack? Use your favorite stacking program. That's not what I do. Yeah. Uh, but you're right, Stefan. A lot of misconceptions about uh, stacking internally. This is not. The shutter, as you said, is open for the duration of the integration that was provided. Yeah. It's not stacking. Yeah. So the difference between that integration and stacking, stacking is I take a picture, I take a second picture, I put the two together to get more detail out. That's stacking. Mm -hmm. Integration is I'm going to look at something and gather as much detail about it as possible. All the photons hitting that CCD, all the little CCD sensor dots there, pixels, right? And then once I've done collecting all those photons and storing in memory everything that I've now built up, I'm going to show you that picture. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to do it again. I'm going to collect all those photons. Once I've done and stored that in memory, I'm going to get rid of the last picture I showed you and give you this new picture. That's integration. It's not stacking. Different. Uh, Excuse me, so yeah. I'm, I'm really absolutely new on this. Okay, so what, what governs the decision of what button you're going to push for integration in terms of the number of seconds? Mostly it's how um, faint your object is, sure. right. what the sky conditions are, it's also tied to gain. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to get into gain, but I'll just quickly say right now, gain is a, it's an amplifier. Mm -hmm. All right? It's an amplifier. So, if I'm in a small room and I need to speak to 100 people, I need a small amplifier. If I'm in a big room, I need a big amplifier. Gain is an amplifier. We're going to get into that. But this is basically, it's the same thing as a, a, a photography. You take pictures with, with film, right? Mm -hmm. When an object you're showing is very faint in light, you need to expose that film for a long time. It's exactly so the same. It's a shutter speed. It's exactly the same. Uh, not a shutter no. speed. No. Because the shutter speed mm -hmm. is how fast. Okay. Well, this yeah. is shutter, shutter, shutter speed is less than a second, or in this case, less than two point. Similar. Two ISO. Seconds. It's how long you collect the light. How long yeah. you collect the light. Yeah. 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 light. Right. So if it's really thin, it takes right. a while yeah. to collect the light. Yeah. To see the yeah. 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 And that's the thing you have to remember. Shutter speed right. means my object is bright, and if go back to film days, if my mm -hmm. object is really bright, I do not want to expose the film too much. It's got to be really fast. That's shutter speed. Shutter speed to off on a film camera is integration because now you're saying I need to leave it open for two, three, five seconds, a minute, five minutes. That's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so going back to this manual here, right now we're going to talk about quantity of 999. All you need to know is when you go to the customs, you can choose any amount of seconds you want up to 99 minutes, which whatever that is in seconds. Okay? Um, and the day somebody comes out with a 99 minute camera, we're going to increase it. We're actually, uh, actually I've not seen anybody try this, but uh, what about star trailing? Like, turn your mount off, go that long, and watch stars. Wouldn't that work like that? Absolutely. For that? Yeah, I've got to try that. I've never that tried it. Yes, that's yeah. the problem. Those Might, back yeah. Around. Too sensitive. Really, really narrow. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, it would just blow out. Yeah, it's too sensitive. Okay. Rock made it too good. <laughs> now, when we're going to get into this uh, number of uh, quantity, we're going to 
talk about this in another section um, because it's, it's it has to do with capturing images and it has to do with the point of automatically saving those pictures instead of just showing me something. Longer exposures may not be needed uh, as much gain. So remember I said gain is an amplifier. So think about two things. I can amplify the amount of light that's coming into the sensor and I can leave the sensor open to stare at that light. If the object is really faint, I can leave my shutter open for longer periods. Or, if I have a lot of light pollution, I don't want to leave it open for longer periods. I want to leave it open for shorter periods. But now I'm getting zero <laughs> object resolution. I can increase the gain a little bit. I can amplify a little bit and reduce my exposure. Okay, now I'm amplifying too much. Remove, reduce the gain, and the shutter longer. It's a balance between the two, right? High gain, low shutter, or low integration. Low gain, higher integration. And if you've got a really dark site and you're pointing at a pitch black sky and looking for something that's extremely faint, you increase the gain more, you increase the shutter more, I'm not sure what you're going to get, but it is possible. Okay? But it's a balancing act. That's why I said at the beginning, what are the two things you're looking at? Gain. Integration or exposure control. Game, exposure. That's what you need to know. Steph, it's worth emphasizing what Rock emphasizes, which is that if you use game to get more light rather than exposure, if you've got a mount that doesn't track that well, mm -hmm. you don't really want to have too long an exposure because then you're going to get all yeah. kinds of nasty mm -hmm. effects. Whereas yeah. if you increase the gain, you can go for the shorter exposure and get away with murder with a mount that is less than perfect. Yeah. So the flexibility is there. So I can't tell you, take your scope and look at this object and set your things to this. Right. Because, you see, you could increase the gain, reduce the exposure, increase the exposure, reduce the gain. You might get the same result. You know, a gain of four and a seven second may look exactly the same as a gain of five and three seconds. You have to play with it. And it depends on the sky conditions and the light pollution and the guy walking by with the flashlight. Whatever. <laughs> and, and whether or not you polar aligned your, your scope. Yes, well, that that's true, right? Yeah. If yeah. you can't track more than 10 seconds with your scope, yeah. you're going to get star trails. Well, there you go. Yeah. Also, also focal ratio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's tons of things that come into play. Yes. What's the level there? Is that the, Sorry, this? Yeah. Okay, now this. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. You don't touch it. Yep. This had to do with the electronic lens control. That's what the ELC is for, and that's what that, that security camera feature. You wired the electronic lens outside the camera and handled the exposure there. And they weren't doing exposures. They were literally doing lens levels. That's what it was. So next year when we come here, that'll be an effect. <laughs> Who knows? He's getting ready. You know what? On a Tuesday morning, the rock calls me up, and I go, okay, what do we got? Yeah. Tuesday morning, he called me up and said, okay, the exterminator's ready. Can you get the software ready for the weekend? I'm like, what? <laughs> no pressure. Okay. No pressure. So, and, I, and it's got to do this. Uh. I'm thinking maybe we could do that. It's like, okay. <laughs> so there you go. Game, the other important thing. Game, AGC. Automatic game control. Got three modes. You have off, you have on, and you have manual. Next to off, it says CCD mode. A CCD, it should be CCD imager mode or imager mode. A CCD imager does not have gain. You cannot adjust the gain on a CCD imager. All right? CCD imagers, it's just, that's what you get. You do something else. You do exposure. You do binning. You do stacking. You don't play with the game. On, because it's called automatic gain, on means it's going to automatically change the gain based on what you're looking at. Okay? So you go, well, why don't I do that? Okay, so you're looking at a bright object and you want to tweak out more detail in something fainter, but if I reduce the gain because it's too bright, remember the, the mm -hmm. chronograph, mm -hmm. the sun problem? Mm -hmm. Same thing, right? It's going to go, oh, it's too bright. So automatic gain not a good idea. You can do it though. Okay? What you do is you say, set it to automatic, and this is the man maximum level. So if you say set this to four and put this to odd, 
automatic gain control will adjust the gain between 0 and 4. It will never go above 4. So you can say, don't go past 4, but adjust it how you think. You can play with this. You'll see the difference. And slew to different objects. Or go to a bright star, and it'll slew off a bit. And you'll see what the gain, you'll see in the picture of the camera, the, in the, the, the screen, you'll see it change. But if you put it on auto, what are you saying? So remember, AGC stands for automatic gain control. So on means automatic. Mm -hmm. Off means it's full blast. Hang on a second. I said off was full gain, full blast. I was wrong. Off is off. It's the same as setting it to manual and then zero. So for the rest of the talk on gain, anytime I talk about gain full blast, what it actually is is the unity gain is enabled or gain off. I'm not playing with the gain, okay? It's full blast. It's, everything is full. Because the automatic, that's the key word, it's the automatic control. The automatic control is completely off. That means it's full blast. On means I'm going to tell you to, or I'm going to let you choose it automatically. Okay, I see, I don't I see the second and last line. Does that mean that the three minute, uh, three minute will automatically take into effect automatically? Yeah. That's why it's nice and bold, because this is where we talk about I the safety that. timer and, and what it's for. So, if I were to change this and make it simpler, this should say gain full blast, gain automatic, and gain manual. Got that? Full blast, automatic, manual. But because the section is called automatic gain control, that's what you're controlling. It's the automatic control feature. So again, if I turn this on here, I can say 4 and it's not going to increase the gain past four, and it'll adjust it in there, okay? Or you set it to manual and you choose the level. A good gain to start, four. Yep. So essentially, if you put AGC on, but put the maximum level right at the top, it's the same thing than just leaving it off. No. So this is the same as putting this Okay. Okay. Off means do not automatically change it, just turn it on full. Mm -hmm. This to 8 means from automatically change anywhere between 0 and 8. This means set it to this number, period. Okay? So, so I'm confused. <laughs> How do you turn AGC off where you don't have AGC on? Manual 0? Manual 0. Right? Zero. Manual 0. That's oh. 0 gain. All this time I'm going off. I'm off putting is AGC off. off. Is AGC full. Wow. Okay. It's, it's and if you set yourself a preset mm -hmm. where everything is set up and you have AGC at zero, mm -hmm. then you can go. Oh, and geez. there you okay. go. Done for you. So completely off is manual zero at yeah. the fixed level. Yeah. yeah. Manual zero means your your okay. gain is zero because your gain. Oh, that's one maybe last. And the reality is just for anybody that's that sort of still cool. thinking of starting out on this. There you go. Steph says you can Too play, you can play with the, the AGC <laughs> automatic on and just watch what happens. But just do that for curiosity. Okay. If you're actually trying to, to, to observe because you've got a good night, don't play with it. Yeah. Just okay. stick to manual. Yeah. Yeah. Stick yeah. to manual, put it on four, and leave it. Yeah. At the beginning, don't play with game. Put it on four and change the exposure. Yeah. You won't get perfect pictures. You won't get exactly what you want every night or everything. But you're going to learn more about the camera that way. Because once you start doing gain and exposure, mm -hmm. it can be trickier. So just leave gain to four and just do exposure for a while. Once you get comfortable, when you change your gains, you change it one number at a time. You don't go from four to eight. No. You go from four to five or four to three. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want a little bit more gain or a little bit less gain. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Is okay. there is there a waiting period in between a few seconds when you change? Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Oh, That's really? That's why okay. there's a three minute safety time. So every time you go, like uh, for example, fix level eight to seven, you gotta wait three, three minutes. minutes. Seven to six, three minutes. Wow. Three minutes. So I'll, show you, I'll show you how to cheat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so don't don't use scroll with the mouse. Yeah. Blue. Yes, and it is a safety. Okay. Cheat. okay. It is absolutely yes. a safety. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, manual integration, you set the amount of uh, uh, seconds and, sorry, manual integration. 
Sorry, that's the wrong. Uh, that, should be th this should be here. These two dots yeah. should be here. All right. Well, let me fix that. I was definitely <laughs> copying and pasting <laughs> slides. So, okay, any AGC change triggers a three minute safety timer. What is a three minute safety timer? Does it mean the camera's going to blow up? No. <laughs> when you look at the camera and you say the AGC set to four and I set it to five, look at your preview. Watch what happens. Your, your screen almost goes black. Because what happens is the CPU and the chip now is saying, okay, clear the memory, let's start over. And, and this is why when you turn the camera on, there's also the three minute timer. The CCD does a couple of things. What it wants to do is it wants to find a black frame. So it basically blacks everything out. It creates a black frame internally so that it knows what black is. Then it starts to collect photons to see how things go. Remember, there's circuit inside that's always adjusting your image. No matter what you choose, there's always going to be something going on, right? There's memory in this camera. There's a CPU in this camera that's actually intelligently doing stuff with these pixels. And all of this process takes three minutes. And if you watch, you'll see from a black screen, the image starts to build. And every single time you make one change to AGC, it triggers that reset inside the camera. So we've put in the timer on software. If you know about it, you can go and change another setting. But the problem is, is that you're not going to get instant gratification because you've got to wait camera's still doing stuff, right? You could you could say, I'm not going to bother with the timer, but the camera's going to go, I'm doing my stuff. <laughs> oh, you want me to change all this stuff? Yeah, whatever. I'm still busy here. And then the next thing you know, I'm done, and I'm going to say, okay, now I'm going to process that. I'm changing this. What do you mean it didn't work? I'm changing it back. I'm going back over here. I'm going back over here. Because you were too busy going, why is it working? The camera has a good memory. The next thing you know, your camera goes bananas. It locks up. The software locks up. You're going, wow, this is no good anymore. <laughs> and you're on the phone to Steph complaining. <laughs> That's how it works. Pretty easy. Remember I said you can change the gain, and I'll show you how to cheat. You want to go from 8 to 4? Don't click the down and the up. Highlight the number. With the drag of the mouse. Mm -hmm. you type 4 and press enter. Yeah, one three minute timer. Yeah. Okay? That's yeah. all. It's a three minute timer per change, not mm -hmm. per level. So you can go from eight to four and only wait three minutes if you do it that way. But if you hit the down arrow, every time you hit the down arrow, it sends the change to the camera. The camera says, okay, I'm going. So I'm again. On the other hand, as Steph said previously, yeah. go stepwise. Anyway, so and then yeah. do a little bit of imaging and see, see whether you're at the right age you see and yeah. then yeah. make another change. Yeah. The chances of you actually going from four to eight, it's, it's, it could happen, but it would be very rare. That's right. yeah, yes. Can you explain the line about um, manual is the best control available for CCD games? Or is it this okay, manual CCD. is the best control available for the game because it precisely allows you to tell the camera what you want, mm -hmm. and the game doesn't change. So if you were to set it to automatic and let the camera decide, and you're trying to figure out, you know, how come when I'm looking at this object and I say seven seconds, something's not right here. It, it, it's, it's almost if like the camera is clamping down and, and, and reducing the brightness of my image halfway through my picture. Because your gain is being controlled by the photons that are hitting it. So let's take another it's example. It's refreshing more often than... Not refreshing. Or Remember if I turn on the CCD imager for seven seconds. Mm -hmm. That means that that CCD chip has got its eyes wide open for seven seconds. Somebody walks by with a flashlight. Oh my God, that's right. Mm -hmm. If I have AGC set to automatic, mm -hmm. the AGC, that amplifier circuit, yeah. is so going to move all over the place during that seven oh, seconds. Oh, that's what I meant. So it's, that's no good. It's, it's, it's instantaneously adjusting. Imagine yes. you're, you're listening yeah. to your hi-fi, mm -hmm. and you're listening to some rock and roll. And you've got an amplifier which actually has automatic amplifier control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as the guitars cut in and the yeah. drama goes crazy, the sound goes down. Now that's a good thing for TV, by the way, when the commercials come on. <laughs> but when you're listening to music, especially classical music, yeah, like dynamics. you've got really quiet passages, mm -hmm. and then you've got big passages. Mm -hmm. If everything was the same volume, it would be horrible. And you only fix okay. Pick yeah. your fixed level. Yeah. So gain is important. Exposure is important. Those are the two things that are really important. And again, remember, your best bet is manual set the level. 
Um, and Chris was actually just saying, on daytime solar maybe, stuff like that, you yeah. may want to set to, to on for the automatic function, right? Mm -hmm. And set a maximum level so it doesn't go over that. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time, you're, you're going to deal with it. Yeah, I know. You're going to deal with it. Okay? White balance, basically white balance, if you're counting the camera, what does white look like? Because depending on the conditions, white may look different. Um, really, the important things here is um, I would leave it on manual. So there's auto trace white control, which is APW. There's auto white control, which is the AWC. And then there's manual. Now, auto trace white control basically looks at the light and it says, OK, I think white looks like that. It looks the white light that's coming into the camera. It's adjusting it. Why is white important? Well, because it's color, right? It's, it's to figure out what your color settings are. So it's just going to do it automatically. The second one is not quite automatically. What it is is you point the camera to an object that is white, and you press the set button, and you say, this is what I want you to reference as white. If you point it to a yellow piece of cardboard and say, this is what I want to reference as white, it's going to think that that's white. And your color pictures are not going to come out looking right. Okay? But the best bet is to leave it at manual and adjust the color yourself. That's your best bet. And the best numbers are two and four. That gives you pretty good representation of what you're seeing as uh, pretty close to a true color. You can adjust up and down. Again, you don't have to go crazy here and you know go to red to eight, blue to fault to two. You can basically turn your camera into a black and white one just by setting both of these to zero. Basically killing all the color. You could do that. Good thinking. <laughs> but it's not the same as a true black and white imager. Because a color imaging chip has to handle all three colors in a pixel that a black and white imaging chip doesn't. But what happens? Well, you're kind of cutting your resolution down by a third on the color one because you've got to handle three colors. Whereas the black and white imager has only got to handle that it's either white or it's black or a shade of it, right? So if I were to think of a, a, uh, a camera with a lens that had three different colors on it. You remember the War of the Worlds? This alien had three colored lenses? I thought that was so cool, the RGB lenses on the aliens. One third of the lens is going to see the right, the red, one third is going to see the green, and one third is going to see the blue. So at any one particular color, you're only using one third of the size of the lens. You're kind of doing the same thing with a CCD imaging chip when it's a color. Black and white one, you're using the entire pixel to read the black and white pixel. An interesting note though is because your eye perceives that color gives you more detail, people will think that color pictures show more. Mm -hmm. But in actual scientific fact, black and white pictures are going to give you more detail because of the technology. It's just the way it is. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, you set it to manual and adjust your colors. Red, two, blue, four. You can also do Partial infrared and near infrared, if you want to try and capture some of that. And that's, you said, the 3200K or 5600K. And these are color temperatures based on camera and photo dates. Um, I haven't played much with those the infrared and near, near infrared and partial infrared, but they're available. 99% of the time, this is my setup. And maybe I'll adjust the red up or down one or the blue up or down one based on what I'm looking at. You know, I like to make my black eye galaxy purple, whatever. Um, that's usually the pretty good settings for this. And again, it's called white balance, but it's actually to manage color. Because the camera has to know what white looks like, and then it knows what to deviate to get the rest of the colors. And that's why white balance is, is somewhat important. But if you set it to manual and you leave it like that, to the end of your days, most of your images are going to come up with correct colors. It's just the way it is. Uh, some nebulosity ones that you're going to have, some nebulas, you may want to tweak some of the colors a bit to get more detail out, depending on what you're looking at. But again, it's, a, it's what you're looking at, your sky conditions, your scope, all that stuff. 
Alright, Tech Cooler. Only available on the Extreme or the X2, so everybody that doesn't have one of those, you can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> the cooler basically cools the CCD chip down, right? You want less noise. CCD chips are inherently noisy things because they're running with power going through them and they get hot. You want to cool this chip down because it generates less of that, that electrical noise, okay? That gives you better pictures. You control this. This is not to turn the CCD or the, the cooler on and off, by the way. Understand this. This is the noise detection circuit that you're talking to, not the cooler. You can't tell the cooler what to do. You have to tell the noise detection circuit to tell the cooler to do something. Inter important misconception. If you set this to on, that means that the noise detection circuit is on. It's going to detect noise and it will tell the cooler what to do. If you set this off, the noise detection circuit is basically saying, I don't exist anymore. Remember, I, what did I say? Can you tell the cooler what to do? No. So what is it? It's on full blast, period. Okay? So what does this noise detection circuit do? And this is important to note, okay? You don't turn the noise detection circuit on after you've been imaging for four hours. It's not going to remove your hot pixels anymore. Because the noise detection circuit looks at the picture and says, from now until the next picture I look at, have there any hot pixels that have appeared? If I turn it on after four hours and the hot pixels are there already, the noise detection circuit says, from now until the next picture, have any hot pixels appeared? No, nope. they're already all there. <laughs> Useless. Turn it on right away. Turn it on right away. This also is allowing you to select the section of the chip that you want that circuit to look at. By default, set them all. Mm -hmm. And instead of you going and clicking all the boxes, hit this and it'll just select them all. Okay? How sensitive is it to these hot pixels? Normally I leave it at 8, but you could change it. You could drop it down if you're not getting that many hot pixels. Um, and you maybe reduce the sensitivity of it depending on what you're looking at. But I just turned it on to 8. And then there's this do removal. So, we're going to talk about this in a second. You turn this on, you set all the stuff, you say to 8. Okay, so it's going to be pretty sensitive. It's going to start looking, and then as it sees hot pixels coming on, it's going to say, oh, i got to start cooling the chip. So, if you followed some of Rock's posts on the original CCD chips and problems, you get something from thermal shock, you cool the chip too fast, it's really, really hot. What happens when you take a hot light bulb that you've been burning all day and you drop it in ice water? It's going to shatter. Same thing with the CCD chip, right? These, these thermoelectric coolers drop temperatures quickly. So, I'm going to turn the thermal cooler on. Boom! The chip's hot. Go back to the chip. Bye bye. What about CCD imagers? They don't have this stuff. It's because the cooler's on all the time. So, before the chip gets hot, it's being cooled. Then, as the chip gets hot, the cooler's just on all the time, right? So, what's the problem with the CCD imager that has that cooler all, all the time? What did we have last night? Moisture. Humidity, yep. moisture, mm -hmm. dew. Mm -hmm. When you've got a chip that's cold and all of a sudden you get dew on it, humidity on it, you get water droplets. Mm -hmm. uh, so much for my imaging session, I'm toast. Okay. Uh, so, and your camera could be too. Yep. You can get short yeah. circuits yeah. across the chip. Yeah, it's water. So, this is a rock There's 10, 30, and 60. Let's do a dew removal circuit. What does that mean? It means that if I set this to 30, every 30 seconds, it's going to turn the cooler off. Looks like I did it again. I don't know what I was smoking before this presentation, but I'm not even reading my own writing. It will not turn the cooler off every 30 seconds. It will turn the cooler off for 30 seconds, or 10 seconds, or 60 seconds, to warm up the chip. <laughs> let the chip warm up to evaporate the water that's in it accumulated. And then turn it back on gradually, a little bit at a time, to cool your chip back down. Give a lot of dew, set it to 10 seconds. Give a little bit of dew, set it to 60 seconds. That's what it does. So it's the opposite. You turn it off for 10 seconds when there's only a bit of dew. 
When you have a lot of dew, you set it to 60 seconds so it turns the cooler off for a full minute to let that chip warm up and evaporate more of the water that's gathered there. But remember, you can't tell the thermal cooler what to do, you have to tell the circuit, the detection circuit what to do, right? You either detect the noise and handle the cooler, or the cooler is on his own. He's just running full speed. That's what this is. That's noise detection. That's so, so to be clear, Stephen, when you set the dew removal to 10 seconds, that means that the cooler is being instructed to come on for 10 seconds or on for 50 seconds? Turn off. Turn off every 10 seconds to let the chip warm up a little bit. Okay. And then it turns back on to cool the chip down. Is that on a 10 second cycle? No. It, it's every 10 seconds it turns off. Okay. And then it turns back on. So okay. it turns the chip off and then turns the chip back on, but it's checking the temperature. Okay. Okay. Well, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm asking how would you recognize, and I know the answer is, how would you recognize this dude building up on the chip? Uh, your could picture be, looks funny, there's water be, on your telescope, a right, lot of different right, things. Could it be what we came across last night Absolutely. when that when that was coming in from the corner? Mm -hmm. I don't know what that was. No, was, no that wasn't. That was no, something no, else. Usually you get a dark center. Because I, yeah, yeah. I, I think. Oh, is that what it is? You get fuzzy. a dark center? Yeah. yeah fuzzy in the middle. It's fuzzy. like when you drop of water in the middle of the camera, it's like right? Blocking your, yeah. Yeah. You're blocking out the aperture of the center. Yeah. What that is, I don't know what that is, but that was weird. That was yeah. something else. Should, should you so leave that do yeah, removal setting on all the time in a certain setting anyway, just to be safe? But when it's be. not humid, I either I leave it on at 60, or if it's really good, really dry, you can set it off. Yeah. But I just leave it on at 60. Yeah. So that's a safe uh, enough thing to do. And, yeah. And then up at the one yeah, lower. Like last night, I, I was running at 10. So it was bad. Yeah. But I just normally leave it at 60. Yeah. So a common setting. Level 8, preset selected, do removal 60. That's what I do. And it's pretty common. And the levels go up to how much? 8. eight. eight. And 8 is your... That's the maximum sensitivity. It's going to be... This detection circuit is going to be that sensitive to hot pixels. Okay. But again, you've got to turn it on before you start your sessions. Mm -hmm. Right at the beginning of the night. Yeah. Stefan, when you notice do by the black means, yeah. what is the best setting to put? Level 8? and under do removal. So level 8 is not for do. Level 8 is how sensitive is the detection circuit to okay. hot pixels. All right. So it has nothing to do with do. Okay. This here, if you start to notice do, um, I mean, do you want to evaporate it quickly or slowly? Quickly, you put it to 10. Slowly, maybe go from 60 to 30, or if it's off, set it to 60. Um, okay. Okay. That's, that's, you, you can have this preset and save it as you start. Mm. Yes, this will be saved in the presets. Okay, so as part of your presets, you can save this, these settings. Mm. And again, if you know that uh, you, you have a preset called you know heavy dew and you have a preset called dry nights, you can just make these changes and close mm. the presets up. Mm. Yeah. Yes, what you're doing in the software is you're actually you're actually setting variables which will then be sent to the camera. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you call one of your presets, you don't have to write to the camera. That you, that, that preset, when it uh -huh. comes in, writes to the camera automatically, and you'll see the camera change. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I start up, as, uh, as, as Steph was saying, I've got a whole series of presets based on gain. But this area here is all set up completely. So as, as Steph says, my preset the noise detection and so on comes on immediately because I use one of the pre one of the presets as soon as I turn the camera on. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the big problems. People say, oh, okay, I've got hot pixels. Now I'm going to turn on the noise detection. Too late. How come the hot pixels are going away? Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, what does it look like now? And the next picture have any new hot pixels mm -hmm. appeared? Well, no, they're already all there. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. It's not going to know that you've got problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Steph, it's worth pointing out to people the origins of this, which was, uh, which was movement detection. Yes, that's actually yes. it. Remember, these are all based on security camera CPUs. Yeah. So this is actually what's called the motion detection circuit in the security camera right. that allows the security camera to do something based on if it sees motion on the screen. That's, that's what that was for. 
And before this came out, I had actually had conversations with Rock about maybe we could do asteroid detection or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, this is better. So in my Newark, uh, Newark Airport, LaGuardia, and Kennedy, I wouldn't be able to. But there'd be motion all over the time. It would light up. Yeah. 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 So you're yeah. observing deep, like faint objects, and yeah. you want you want to reduce the noise. Would you just turn that off to have your cooler running full? Okay, on yeah. on a night that is very hot and dry, you could leave it on full and not worry about dew. Because mm -hmm. don't forget, if you set this to off, yeah. this doesn't work either. Yeah. Okay. Nothing works. You're basically saying this whole circuit, forget it. Okay. That mm -hmm. cooler's run full blast. So on a hot, dry night, yes, you can do it. If you get humidity though, you're going to get dew build up, and you're going to want to control that. Mm -hmm. So can you do that at midpoint? Like if, if it's a hot, dry night and it starts to be humid, yeah. you can do that, but any hot pixels you currently have on the screen mm. will not be detected uh, when you turn the circuit on. Right. New pixels, hot pixels will. Mm -hmm. But the do circuit will work. Whether this is hot pixels or not, the do circuit works. Except that if it hasn't detected that you've got hot <coughs> pixels, it's not going to turn the cooler on or your chip because it hasn't detected the hot pixels. So if it hasn't cooled your chip, it doesn't have to warm it up to remove dew. So you get that stuff to shut down and start over again? You should always make sure it's on. Either yeah. leave it on, or if you're going to turn it off because it's a hot, dry night, if you start to get humidity, you'll have to let the chip cool down and then turn the circuit on and restart it again. So yeah, you could do that. Um, it doesn't happen often that you get a hot, dry night, and all of a sudden, next what? thing you know, there's humidity. Hot, dry nights are far and few. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. okay. It's like a toy mountain, though. Well, maybe in Arizona. Remember that? Yeah. 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 seen it coming up the hill, and now it's yeah. small. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, that's... Yeah. Uh, BLC and APC. Uh, BLC is cool. A lot of people talk about VLC, what do I do with VLC, la 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 Well, it reduces the amp flow. Well, wait a minute. I, I thought we didn't have a method to reduce amp flow. Yeah, we do. VLC. So what is VLC? Remember that thing I talked about earlier? You're standing in the doorway, bright sunlight, somebody takes a picture of my face. My face is black because of all the ambient light around, right? So VLC allows me to say, this ambient light here, is wrong compared to what's here. Readjust so that I can actually get a better picture and get my face lit up without having this washing out the picture. So it reduces the brightness or increases the brightness. Hmm. I have hot pixels in a corner. Okay? Choose everything else but your hot pixels. So if your hot pixels are in this corner, choose everything else and turn on VLC. And what that says is, this here is washing out my image because it's got this green glow that I don't like. And I hate to use this term because it's not really what it's doing, but it brightens up this image here so that it kind of dims this one. What it actually does is it says, this is brighter than this. I'm going to rebalance to try and, and adjust those levels so they're closer. Thus, in theory, making the amp flow disappear. We did this also another night, I was showing Jim this the other night, is uh, it's the North American Nebula. Yes, because there's a big cluster, there's a tons of huge bunch of stars in mm -hmm. part of it, and then the rest is nebulosity, so oh, it's yeah. dimmer. So what happens is, is on one section of the North American Nebula, there's a lot of stars here, really bright, but it was washing out because down here it was very light nebulosity. Okay, so I said, select three rows down and three rows across here, turn on VLC. The next thing you know, after a little while, the image started to balance out. The stars didn't seem to stick out as bright, the nebulosity started to come out. Because the CPU inside is actually looking at it and re-averaging those pixels to try and, and smooth out that picture, is what it's doing. That's what VLC does. Stuff on? Yeah, yeah. Last night I was watching, I used to do it that way. I was watching Rock last night. You know what he's doing now? He's reversing that. Where the amp blow is, he's not checking it. He's checking everywhere else. That's I'm, what I just said. Okay, that picture's showing it's checked. 
Yeah, I know. But <laughs> what I said is you've got amp glow here. Yes. Select everything else right. but there. Okay, okay, because that's Sorry, what he's doing. I, it's I all... Should've, I should have done okay. picture differently. But yeah. you're right. You select where it's dim. Right. Yeah. Not where it's bright. Yeah, because before we, uh, we were selecting the opposite way. Yes. And, and you're screwed making it up. worse. Yeah. That's yes. right. Yes. It's the other way around. Okay. Now, the peak here <laughs> is basically if you don't want to have to check areas, you can do the entire thing, but then what's the point? Okay? Peak just adjusts the whole BLC as opposed to individual cells. But why do you want to do that? Mm -hmm. I'm going to adjust the brightness and contrast on my capture device instead, right? right. So you don't really use it. So off on, and there you go. And again, save this in presets. You can have it called the Amplow or something. I don't know. Or yep. North American Nebula or whatever. <laughs> Out of interest, the, the, that particular example of the, the North American Nebula, what was the time frame for the adjustment yeah. to take place? But it's integration. Oh, it, it, no, it's not integration. No, no. But it's integration. You said integration. Yeah, Okay. Refresh. One refresh. Okay. So fine. yeah, if you've got an integration of you know 40 seconds, well fine. after you've adjusted it, the next one 40 seconds yeah. later will come up. Yeah. Okay. Now, Excellent. you're not going to see. Oh my God! It's very subtle, <laughs> but you go, hey, it did something. Yeah. yeah okay. Because yeah. it doesn't want to really whack your picture out. Right. It's, yeah. a, it's a very subtle thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Automatic pixel control is the amount of in-camera processing. In camera processing is that inside the camera you can actually tweak out extra little details by allowing the automatic pixel control to kind of pull more details out of certain areas. But the problem with APC is you can end up getting square stars because it's going to try to tweak out the extra detail that it may see in a star. It thinks, well, there's there's brightness bleeding into the other edge. Mm -hmm. Remember, pixels are square, right, on a CCD chip. Mm -hmm. So. If you're looking at a galaxy, uh, I know there's a little more detail in there. You might want to increase the APC vertical and horizontal. So horizontal, vertical, right? If you increase both, you get squares. If you increase one, you get lines or lines. And if you crank them both all the way up, you're square, your stars are going to be square. If you only do one all the way up, you're going to have lines for, for stars. You're going to say, star trails. <laughs> but that's what it's used for. Okay? If you really want to tweak out some fine little detail in a galaxy or something, or some nebulosity and stuff there. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, you just leave them off. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when I see broadcasters, they usually match those numbers. Is that normal? Typically, because it's very rare that you're only going to want to look at the detail this way or this way, right? You want to see the whole detail. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Sometimes I might just normally press it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, it, it depends. It really depends on how you want to deal with this, right? And like I said, if you see some pixels that are not quite right, you can tweak them with this. Yeah. Or if you're looking at details that, I don't know, the stick galaxy has everything this way. <laughs> Whatever you want. Yeah. So that's what this is for. <laughs> now we got various other options. Gamma. If you're using a uh, video monitor, uh, Gamma 45 is better than Gamma 1. This is uh, what the black looks like. And you can see very quickly on, on a computer screen, you set the gamma to 1, preview screen, the black is really black. Compared to if you set it to 0.45, it doesn't seem to be as black. So this is just a preference thing. Coronagraph we talked about, remember for solar, you want to black out the brightest part of the picture. Um, horizontal and vertical reverse, it literally takes your picture and does this, or does this. Yep. Uh, positive, negative. That's kind of neat because you can reverse and have black stars on a white background. You might want to check the spelling. Make of what? Start black on white background. What? Make start. Yes, my starts are all black on a white background. <laughs> I speak the English very good, yes. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, you're just reversing black and white. This is actually good for what Michael's doing. Astronometry. The astronometry, you're looking for the uh, asteroids. Uh, because it's a lot easier to see a black pixel on a white background than to see the white pixel on the back background. I like to see what you see. Mm. Yeah, we can do a metal app. See some more no, 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 sure, yeah, no. you can pull out detail with this. It's kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah. Color bars. Mm. Mm. That's to turn on your color bars. What's the first thing you do to see if your camera's connected and talking? Bars. Turn on your color bars. <laughs> what happens if you don't get color bars? You try all the other buttons? No, no that's right. <laughs> 
Turn on the color bars. If they don't appear, your camera's not talking to the computer. That's it. Don't press everything else and get everything all in a bunch. It's useless. Check okay. your connections. Check your connections. Check your USB serial adapter. That's a horrible one. Mm -hmm. Steph, I have to step outside just in case my temper's going away. But yeah. when you're talking about APC, yes. did you mention that it's also a very useful technique for getting stars that look a little elongated? Yes, like? we did that. And that's how you adjust. Ah, I got these weird stars, they look straight. I'll mm -hmm. adjust your APC a little bit. So we talked about the point that most people will follow both horizontal and vertical at the same time, unless you're adjusting this picture, then in that case, you may want to do one opposite the other or different than the other. Again, one is, you know, they look like this, and one they look like this. Mm -hmm. uh, other various options, we talked about zoom. Uh, this is the other thing too, you turn on zoom, by the way, don't do this with integration set to like 20 seconds, because when you turn on zoom, it's gonna take 20 seconds to show. Then you go to zoom one, it's gonna take 20 seconds to show. Then you go to zoom two, it's gonna take 20 seconds to show. Some people go, zoom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All of a sudden the camera goes, what are you doing to me? <laughs> don't do that, okay? Turn your integration off. Turn your zoom on. Type 8, press enter. Going to go right away to the zoom. When you're focused, turn it off. Leave it on 8. The next time you want to refocus, you just turn it back on. You don't have to zoom back in and zoom back in. And this again is where the presets come in. Presets. All of my presets have a zoom yeah. set to 8, but of course the zoom is off. That's right. Until I turn it on, because I'm only using it for focus, and I'll always use 8. Yeah. Okay. No, I've actually used zoom on planetary with a bar. Yeah, on a small planet in Nebulae, it's actually quite interesting to see what happens when we go two or three. Yeah. Yes. Uh, crosshairs, cross boxes. People have, oh, my graphic got messed up. No, that's the, no, it's the wall. No, it did get messed up. Anyways, people have often asked me, why is the line so thick? I send the CPU the command to say, create me a line Start it here, end it here, and make it this thick. And this is as thin as the damn okay. CPU will accept. <laughs> <laughs> I can set it to a lower number, but the line doesn't shrink. The CPU is saying, yeah, 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 you want one. Yeah, I'm going to give you four. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there you go. By the way, when you look at this, you're going to notice that this may not look perfectly centered in your preview screen. That's because the chip doesn't exactly follow 640 by 480 or 720 by 480. It's a little bit different. So your screen looks a particular size, but this is centered on the chip, by the way. It just, the chip doesn't appear in the center of the capture. Because mm -hmm. captures go with computers, right? Last night I took notice of that when we were doing, when yeah. and I was there with the hand control and I kept looking at the screen and thinking, Centered. If I would have eye centered that, I would have been like a little bit over more. Yeah. And I just and I believe I'm it's because the chip is 708 by 480, and mm -hmm. computers don't do that. They do 720 by 480 or 640 by 480. Yeah. And by the way, if they do 640 by 480, they compress the picture, so you still got that offset thing. Mm -hmm. It's just that's just. So is it my imagination, or did an early version of the software draw these lines white, and now it draws them back? Because I have this recollection of them originally being white. Oh, okay, great. you were looking at the beta version that I had thrown tons of stuff in there. It oh, had okay. virtual dub stuff in there. It had everything but the kitchen yeah. sink and it kept yeah. crashing. I said, then uh, <laughs> I also had colored reticles, yeah. black or okay. white, and all oh, kinds of Oh, yeah, I remember yeah. that. That was a mess. Mm -hmm. That was just a mess. Warren out there now. That's why I dashed out some chicken. Freeze. Why do you want to freeze? Yeah, you can do that. You know, I, I'm looking at, uh, you know, M51, and I hit the freeze button, and now I want to slew to something else. That picture won't change. You won't get those star trails in the picture, right? It's showing 51. The problem is if you're using your camera to see where you're going, right. you can't see. <laughs> but that's that, right? Freeze. Oh, um, we all have your frame out. They all swoop directly where <laughs> yeah, we want exactly. to. <laughs> That's true. Now, um, field can be used at viewing the planet. Uh, it freezes only one of the two fields in the frame. What's a field in the frame? That's a video curve. Okay? 
every frame has two fields. When you're sending out a video signal, you're sending out 29 point something frames per second. Mm -hmm. Every frame has two fields. It shows two points. Don't worry about it. It's a video thing. You can use field or you can use frame. It makes absolutely no difference. You will never, ever see the difference. Ever. Always turn freeze off before making changes to the camera. Okay. <laughs> Good idea. And then priority, we don't need to see. We don't need to send priority. Okay. Could you please explain the priority uh, between the sense and AGC? Because the other program that I use is making my camera go to sense under priority. And sometimes I forget to go in the menu and check and I'm using it all night and it's I find later it's in sense. So if it is in sense, what's sense. happening? I don't even know why they would set it to sense. Something about something using off the C C D chip and AGC is off the amplifier. Uh, I know you're supposed you to leave it in the AGC. The, you should always run it off of the AGC. Yes. I mean, the amplifier is in line. It's always there. Mm. Maybe if you, perhaps if you, this, I think this may, this may be in the, the these guys are the imager guys, right? Yeah, I was going to say, would that be AGC. more for CCD mode? So, they want to pull the stuff yeah. off the, the I mean, off the from my understanding of priority is how the rest of the CPU and the camera handles your image processing. Yeah. And it should always be based on AGC because you've got that amplifier. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. I increase the amplifier, the rest of the processing should be adjusted based on that. Mm -hmm. okay. You've got that amplifier there, it's there. Right? You don't turn that off. Yeah. Well, you could. You set it to manual zero, but you know you want to adjust that yourself. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why you would ever want to use sense on it. It's always AGC. Always yeah. AGC. You've got the amplifier in there. All right, the safety timer. When you change this to 128, mm. or you change the AGC, the safety timer is triggered. It's not a safety timer. You're not going to blow up the camera. But if you don't wait three minutes, mm. you're going to get unpredictable results when you start changing a bunch of other settings because you're not going to see anything. So you click more, and the next thing you know, the camera basically ignores you and says, yeah, you're too pushy. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. Now, advanced users, you can actually get rid of the safety timer, so it, not, it never ever triggers. In the config, there's a checkbox that says disable safety timer, but you're going to get a nice big warning every time you start the software that says, you've disabled the safety timer now, remember. Mm -hmm. So, you can do this, though. And if you do disable the safety timer and you want it permanently disabled, remember, we talked about yesterday the config section. There's a save config button. You save the config. Mm -hmm. That way the software starts. The safety timer will never come into play on the software. Okay? Uh, that's what that one is. That's the, you get the safety little error message. And that's pretty well the software. Now, there's one thing I didn't talk about. was those whole uh, load and save presets. We, we, we talked about this a little earlier. But if I look at the, the uh, let's go back to the beginning here. I can do it here. That's fine. See these load and save presets? Mm -hmm. If I hit load, it's going to show me the different MC files when I go to the folder. It's going to see these are the MC files. I've got, remember the, the Deep Sky, Planetary, Lunar, mm -hmm. um, user defined default. When the software starts, the default.mc file loads into the software. But you're not talking to the camera yet. So when the software starts, you should read from the camera. So that you know what the camera set up. If you start the software and then you connect to the camera and then you load a preset file, when you load that preset file, it's going to send it to the camera. So if you don't care what the camera was, you just want it to set to this, and you can do that now. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what you can do. You can save these preset files as many as you want, you can call them anything you want. Okay? So if I want my preset file to be called M51. Dark sight Celestron 8 inch, because that's what I use when I look at that object at a dark sight, put an 8 inch. You can do that. Configure everything you wait, all the stuff you like, save it, call it that. 
The next time you want to load it, you hit load, you find that file name, and you load it in. And it sends it automatically. And it sends yeah. it. When you load the file, it'll send the stuff. That's, that's presets, really. That's how you do presets. And it's really up to you how you want to handle preset files. Now, if you're using uh, build software, the build slick software, the preset files are compatible between the two software. Okay? So if one night you're using one software, the other night you're using the other software, and you've already got a preset file made that you like from one, you can load it in the other one. It'll read it. It'll work fine. Mm. That's presets. And that's good. pretty well the whole software and all the features on the camera. Excellent. I learned stuff. Yeah, that was yeah. very nice. Nice.